in this short run through, we're going to have a look at some of the big ideas and some of the skills and that that you'll need to attempt the investigating science examination. And we're going to go through a lot of things, a bit of background on the exam, a bit of background on how it works, and then um, looking at some examples. And so first bit there we're going to look at towards the exam and sort of how the exam's set up. Then the big ideas in the course and littered through that we're going to look at some basic strategies that you can take into the exam to try and maximize your chance of achieving as best as you can. And so there's a few things to consider. Um, a lot of the ideas in here, and this is why this is about big ideas, go across multiple modules. And so when you're doing your revision, it's possibly a good idea to think about those ideas across different modules because there's a very good chance that questions, particularly the extended response questions or the longer questions, will incorporate some of these things that go across and some of these themes that go across multiple modules. And so one example there that you can look at there is that in module six, there's some investigations on the relationship in reactions and speed and things like that. Um, those could be things that are used as parts of the examples in module five. So in module five, you develop your own inquiry questions, you do your own investigations. It might be pertinent to actually use those contexts or examples from module six. Also, have a good idea about your depth study um, and think about you know, your depth study. What did you need to talk about? Think about the structure. Think about your discussion. You would probably have to have talked about ver um, variables, accuracy, reliability. And so think about those things there as well. And also, when you're doing your revision, think about all the examples. Um, it's possible that they will just take one of those examples and ask you to speak about it. And so, you know, it's, it's an idea to have an example of that. And particularly when you look at some of the past exams. Another thing to consider when you're attempting the investigating science exam is how the questions are asked. So this is a very quick breakdown of the first two exams in the um, 2020 HSC or the what a lot of people are calling the new HSC. And if you look there, you've got biology and chemistry and physics um, all have a lot of words, a lot of stimulus in it. Um, as you'd expect, a, a paper on biology probably would ask some wordy questions compared to physics and chemistry. Um, and then you've also got there the idea of diagrams and stimulus, so things you have to interpret. Um, again, something like chemistry and physics, you'd expect there to be a, a lot of things there as well. Now, you also have there, compare those to investigating science. And the first two investigating science exams had more words than the other ones. They also had a lot of stimulus in there, particularly in 2020. It went from 14 bits of stimulus or diagrams to 25. And one of the... Th in and of itself, that wouldn't necessarily be um, too much of a concern. But when you look at the breakdown between multiple choice and short answer, and so you've got there two thirds or about two thirds of the words and two thirds of the diagrams are in the multiple choice. And so there's a lot of information to unpack in the multiple choice exam. And this is something that you need to reflect on when you start answering the questions. Um, also, have a look there, sort of the idea of the different questions that are asked, and there's a lot of what, which, explain, and that there. And so explaining and getting the information across is very important. And particularly when you look at this when it comes to the free response. Explaining a concept, explaining the meaning behind something is the one of the big important things there. And you can also have a look at some of the verbs in there. Um, and particularly if you look at the multiple choice, it's sort of reasonably simpler verbs. But when you get to the short answers, there's a lot of explaining, there's a lot of outlining, there's a lot of 
and if you even look their design in, the, in part of it there as well. And so when you're looking towards the exam, keep those things in the back of your head. Don't dwell on them too much, but do sort of consider them. And this is where the first little strategy you can think about here is that when you look at the exam, particularly the multiple choice, that's 20 marks, 20%. And so probably about 40 minutes of your exam time should go to that. And what you're going to find is the first 10 multiple choice aren't that hard to process. The first two, three questions will probably be very simple, straightforward questions. They won't take you a lot of time. But what's going to happen is that once you get to about 10, the questions become a little bit more complex. They'll probably ask you to interpret graphs. They might even ask you to interpret two types of graphs. And so what you need to consider there is how are you going to use your time in the exam? And so a strategy I often tell people is do the first 10 multiple choice. You might even find that you do that in 15 minutes. But the next 10 may take you a lot longer. And when you've only got the 1.8 minutes for each question or each mark in the question, consider is that a good um, use of your time? It might be pertinent to go do some as do the short answer and then come back and do those harder multiple choice questions near the end. Um, and if you've done well in the other questions yeah, it might even give you extra time to do that. Um, you're probably better off doing that than getting to the last seven mark question and only having five minutes to do that. And if you look here, this is the 2020 paper and, and this sort of highlights what I've just said there. The first three questions took up half a page. And these are almost straight recall questions. These are things that if you know it, you know it. But then you get to question 16, which is two graphs, um, or sorry, a graph and a bit of information down below it. And you have to actually interpret that graph and use the information in the table to help you interpret that. So this is quite a complex question. And even I think people who uh, really confident about it may need at least five minutes to do this question so in terms of pacing your exam it's probably better to keep this one till the end and of course I've already mentioned this earlier on there this idea that a lot of the harder questions will probably come from multiple modules and so you know keep in mind which things come from those multiple modules So we're going to look at some of these big ideas and again these ideas are the things that will most likely be asked in some of those extended questions. And this first one here, this idea of peer review. Um, and peer review comes up early on in module 5 and then it's explored in a little bit more detail in module 7. And looking at this idea of what peer review is and why it's important but also this idea that peer review and particularly the modern peer review when it comes to the publish or perish um, pressure that's coming from a lot of institutions, is that distorting that there as well? And so this little sort of little graphic cartoon here sort of highlights a little bit of that publish or perish model where sometimes people will just publish research which doesn't actually have much meaning or is just you know, confirming other people's results. And of course, keep in mind that the peer review process should be reasonably simple. An author submits an article that goes to an editor who will look at it and make a judgment whether there is merit in what's happening and or whether there isn't. And if the editor thinks that what the author has written is garbage, they'll reject it. If they think there's merit, they'll send it to reviewers and those reviewers should have some idea of what the author is talking about. And so in this process here, if someone was doing some research on COVID-19, you wouldn't get someone working in quantum physics to assess it. You'd want people who understand that idea. So you'd send it to microbiologists or in, um, someone working in the field. Now, the, or the assessors may look at it and say, look, this is awesome. They'll accept it. They may reject it. They may say, this person is talking absolute garbage. Um, you know, in the cases of a few examples there, or they might say, look, there's some good stuff here, but we need you to fix something up. 
And of course, it doesn't always work perfectly. In this case here, this is an article that was accepted for publication and way back in the early days of the COVID um, pandemic and someone suggesting that the drug hydroxychloroquine could be a potential treatment. And hydroxychloroquine is now sort of discredited, particularly after people like Donald Trump jumped on the bandwagon. Um, and the thing is though, that this is a legitimate area of research. There are a lot of drugs that are designed for one purpose that are useful for other ones. Um, probably one of the most famous ones is um, Viagra from Pfizer, which was originally a heart medication drug. They just noticed that the male participants in the studies had another effect other than their heart feeling a lot better. And of course, one of the most um, well-known ones is the this one here, allele lymphoid nodular hypoplasia, non-specific colitis and pervasive development disorder in children. That's a mouthful and I've buggered up the bit of the bit of it there, but essentially this is the article that tried to link the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine to the development of autism in young children. And it was accepted. It soon followed thereafter that a lot of other scientists working in the same area looked at it, found there was flaws and many other flaws, including the money for the study coming from lawyers who were suing companies who had made the vaccines and it got retracted. And of course, some people would say that, oh, well, this, this is showing the peer review process doesn't necessarily work. You can also argue that this shows that it does work because once the article has been published to the wider um, scientific community, they can take it down. So it's adding another layer of protection to the peer review process. In our next um, big idea is one that goes across multiple modules. And even when it isn't explicitly stated, the idea of data is really important. So in module five, you look at how you collect it. You look at the idea of sample selection and how many data points you take. You look at primary data, you look at how you can improve that data, and then you go into module six and you look at some quantitative data, chemical safety data, rely, and then module seven into reliability and how you can interpret it and the validity of it. And you know, a lot of people consider almost that start, um, data is the central, one of the central tenets of, or one of the central tools that's used in science. A scientific idea needs data to back it all up. And so when you look at it in a basic idea, you've got two types, or we delineate it into two types, primary data and secondary data. And so some of the main ideas there, you know, primary data is what you collect um, or your team. Remembering that most modern science isn't usually done by individuals, it's usually done by groups. Um, secondhand data, secondary data is stuff that you've taken another team or another person's data and analyzed it. And you know, the examples are, you know, it doesn't, research can come in many ways. We probably don't in science use surveys, focus groups or interviews as much. We're more about observations and experiments. And of course, in secondary data, you don't really need to worry about any of that. You just need to get the data and go for it. And whether it's qualitative or quantitative, again, it doesn't matter. Um, remembering qualitative is just about things or describing objects and quantitative is getting definitive numbers. And of course, the benefits of primary research is that you can control everything. Secondary research can be done quickly, it can be done cheaply. You just need the ability to process the information. And a disadvantage of primary research is that it can cost a lot of money and it can take a long period of time. Usually things like drug treatments take decades sometimes to develop. Um, and of course, in secondary research, key disadvantages are like the data may be old. Um, also, it's maybe a bit hard for you to assess the quality of that data. And you also, as we said before, you need to know about the different types. Um, quantitative you know, numbers, as we said there, and most of our scientific data will probably be quantitative. Qualitative, 
you're probably almost going into the world of social science there. Um, but, you know, it, in some cases like biology and things like that, it can be useful as well. You know, when you're talking about eye color, so you might be looking at things like that. Um, you have two types of qualitative data, and we don't normally talk about it too much. Um, you know, nominal, which is naming things, and ordinal, where you're applying numbers to um, feelings, sometimes feelings and things like that. Um, there is some scope for it in science, but not, not a lot. And normally what we talk about is discrete or continuous data. So discrete can be an example of, you know, how many children have been vaccinated. It's a, it's a discrete number. Continuous might be something like you're measuring um, voltage, which on an analog instrument or even a digital instrument, and that can change. And, you know, you can also, that continuous data can be intervals. So, you know, as I said there, reading a, reading a watch, reading time. Um, or it can be ratio data, so height, weight, and things like that. The main thing to think about there is your quali quantitative and qualitative is, is the main overarching idea. And of course, this question, and here we have question 16 from the 2020 paper. And again, this idea of, it's a very data orientated question. And it's this thing where you have to analyze data, you have to extract information from the data. And this is a question that was answered pretty poorly. Um, but look, it, it is a later question in the multiple choice. It's designed to be a hard question. And it's a hard question because you've got to take the data from the graph at the top there and analyze it and sort of say, well, it, and the question asked very specifically in the year 2009. And so you've got to take, just look at that 2009 data and then work out which had the lowest cataract operations. And if you look here, the data on the top is telling you cataract surgery per million people. And so what you've got to look there is look at each one and say, well, okay, the Mexico has 1,200 per million people. So you then got to go down and multiply 1,200 by the population, get your number there. Then you look at India and India has 4,800 per million and then multiply that by the number of people. Then you look at China and China has 600 per 100 million per million people, multiply that by the population. And then once you've gone through and done all that and compared it to Argentina, you're probably going to come up with a, a number and that's your highest one there. So it's quite a complex operation to do and it's going to take you a little bit of time. But it's the sort of thing that DART have, it, if you are used to manipulating data or you're used to extracting information from um, the stimulus type material, then you'll be able to interpret that information a lot easier. Question 19 does a similar sort of thing. Um, we've only got the one bit of um, a, one bit of data here with a table of information, but you've got to take the information out of there and manipulate it a little bit. And so what you need to do is, again, which is the most effective, which is the least effective. And if you look at it here, the most effective is actually quite easy to manipulate and work out. You can see quite clearly from the data there that polio goes from 350,000 to just over 1300 before and after. And so this makes it quite easy for you to say polio is the most effective. And this is another little technique to use here as well. If you look here, if you can understand that polio is the most effective, that gets rid of answers A and B. So even if you're having trouble with the next part here, you will at least be able to um, give yourself a 50-50 chance. And so then what you have to do is have a look here and basically work out a percentage or work out a bit of a ratio there. And so if you look at the measles one there, you go deaths before vaccination um, and after and work out the percentage of that for both tetanus and measles. And again, this is an example here where you have to look at the stimulus and work that out. Question 22. 
is part A is just simply drawing a graph. Um, the couple of things to work out from this as well is that if you look at the data given to you, it's one over volume, um, but luckily the, the graph section they give you there has got that there as well. So all you simply have to do is just take that data and graph it. Um, in this case here, reasonably simple, but again, it's a skill you should work on. Um, and if possible, depending on the nature of your data points as well, possibly draw a line of best fit using a ruler, um, which as long as your data is suggesting that is, is something to, um, if your data is suggesting a straight linear relationship, then that's what you do. And again, graphing, structuring, graphing and interpreting.